uh, first question is, how are you doing? Uh, you took some time off for the past two, uh, for two months and then you came back. Uh, how are you doing now? Yeah, it's been good. It was, uh, of course, coming back from Christmas break is usually a little bit more quiet. Uh, people might be uh, taking some more time uh, to be with family and, and friends during the time. So coming back uh, from Christmas break in the House of Commons is I don't know if you can say more quiet because it, it never really <laughs> stops with the buzz, but it's uh, a little bit uh, more of an ease back into it uh, in terms of the new year. So that was good. Um, we're still working on some HR items and there are just some things as we all know, the federal government uh, takes time sometimes. So <laughs> it's it's been a good uh, comeback and, and really supportive and NDP has, as always, had my back. So I've had some really good chats and catch up. So it's been really good. That's good. Uh, what made you decide to do the housing tour that you did uh, late uh, in 2020? So housing is probably the number one concern of my constituents. If you look at if, if I could look at all the messages, emails, phone calls, comments, suggestions on social media, housing and things related to housing uh, would by far be the biggest item um, with maybe the exception of suicide. Um, so with that though, there's a whole Canadian history that not a lot of people are aware of in terms of Inuit and housing and that relationship with the federal institution. Um, there is also not necessarily one central location in the territory that has all this information. A lot of individuals are on public housing, um, but there isn't really <clears throat> a central location on what does that mean? How does that impact the economy? Who does own private homes? It, there isn't something to share that full scope and that, that big picture. And there isn't really anything that we know the numbers, we know the stats, but do we know and understand the human experience and those impacts? Uh, I don't think that we do uh, or did, uh, and we understand them more now. And we're getting a more holistic view of exactly what it means for somebody to not have a safe space to lay their head at night and what those trickle effects can be. So that along with the history, uh, again, of the federal institution between the federal institution and Inuit rather uh, a dark Canadian history that still in a lot of ways continues. Uh, so the housing tour was to look at things more full scope and to try and bring more awareness of what has brought us to the situation at this present point in time. Uh, what, what about the NDP appealed to you and made you uh, decide to run uh, with the party? Um, it was the end of August, uh, 2019, somebody from the Nunavut uh, NDP EDA or the Electoral District Association, every party has one in every writing, uh, I had gotten a message from somebody who was a part of that and also a friend who said they wanted to talk about politics. I laughed and I said, <laughs> if you want to ask me about Trudeau, you are asking the wrong person. I have no interest in talking about that man. And they said, no, it's not that, but I'm not going to push on any agenda that you're not interested in. I don't see any harm in having conversations. So I said, why not? Uh, they had showed up at my, we were sitting at my kitchen table, I think it was a Saturday morning, and um, at the end of the conversation, I said, holy, and I used fruitful language, and I said, just so I'm clear, um, you want me to run for member of parliament with the new Democrat party this year in this writing, and the answer was yes, and I said, hold on, let me do my research. First off, let me talk to my mom, that's always number one, yeah. and then let me do my research. Um, politics, especially at the federal level, I think is something that not enough Canadians are made aware of, and that is the fault of the federal government, uh, but in Nunavut, I think it's even more so a uh, step further uh, an even more foreign system uh, because it is in a lot of ways so new. Uh, so NDP, ultimately I couldn't run for a leader I didn't believe in. Jagmeet was the reason I said, yes, I will do it. Uh, and I am interested in, and I, I don't regret that decision. I, there's no way, no way I could ever 
be in a position like this where I couldn't talk about the truth and the reality in the full scope I needed. I couldn't come into a job like this and not be fully transparent. And I couldn't do that with any other party because that doesn't happen in an, any other party. With NDP, I knew I could do that and I have been able to do that so far. I have had <laughs> such honest, transparent, full conversations with all of my leadership, with all of my colleagues, and I have never felt unsupported or unsafe or not comfortable. So, and that's the only way I could ever do a job like this. So NDP, I just, I went in there with the same beliefs, same values, 100%. Uh, it believed in what the party did, but knowing as well, it was gonna be a safe place for me. And it has been. Uh, looking at the North, uh, other than things like climate change and housing, what are some of the main issues that are facing uh, the North? There's a lot of things that intertwine with the items that you had just mentioned. What I have been talking about since I have been elected are my three priorities. Uh, housing has been the number one topic of discussion, but also affordable living so that people can afford to feed themselves and their families and that communities have year round clean drinking water. Whale Cove, for example, every spring season, <clears throat> when the snow mounts, they're on boil water advisory. There's other communities like that too that have just had years of continuous issues with their water uh, resources within their community. So those are my three biggest main things I talk about, but then there are always uh, the other lack of uh, opportunities that people aren't aware that doesn't come with, if you have a lack of basic human rights, then you have a lack of a lot of, a lot of other things. Uh, I'm talking about uh, economic development opportunity, so jobs within the territory for locals, uh, post-secondary education opportunity. There aren't very many options. There's the Nunavut teacher education program, the nursing program, the law program. You'll hear a lot of those specific programs, uh, but when I wanted to go to school for human resource management, for example, I have to leave the territory to do that. So if you want certain specific, uh, and sometimes not even specific, but cer certain post-secondary opportunities simply aren't in the territory, so then you have to leave. Uh, basic health. Most communities, when a woman is expecting a child, she will leave the community four months, or sorry, not four months, four weeks prior to her due date because her community simply doesn't have the resources to handle any sort of complication with a birth. Uh, so very normally for myself being from Baker Lake, uh, my friends and, and family growing up, everybody's sent out a month before they're due. They're sitting in a Southern hospital by themselves unless they've got an approved escort, having their child in this totally different place and then having to bring their child back. Now here in COVID with the mandatory two week isolation, could you imagine having to leave <laughs> your territory a month before, Hopefully your baby is fine. Maybe there might be some complications, so you have to stay longer. And then you have to go into the two-week isolation before you go back home. So along with a lack of basic human rights comes a lack of all these other things that I don't think Canadians necessarily tie in together, um, but they definitely go hand in hand. If you're looking at uh, a lack of living space, you're probably looking at not very many health resources there as well. So uh, it's it's not just the housing that is an issue, even though that is something I definitely talk about the most probably. Uh, there are so many other things that intertwine. And for me, it's how can we assist people externally in the ways that they need it outside of their home if they don't have a safe home to go back to every time. So uh, I think we need to start with that that base, home base, that quality of life. You can often, ref you can see the reflection of that for an individual in their home, in where they lay their head at night. And so for me, it's kind of those three basic human rights, but also all the things that intertwine with it. Uh, you've kind of touched on it, but do you have any uh, main goals uh, with your first term in Parliament? I'm hoping that, I mean, there there's always hope with all the current and previous federal governments. We have definitely seen 
nothing but broken promises, nothing but a lack of equality, a lack of resources that the territory very clearly needs, a lack of justice from all points in time of, you know, and you can look at, I mean, take your pick, residential school, uh, forced TB, uh, when TB epidemics were happening and are still happening throughout Inuit Nungangat and the territory, uh, Inuit were sometimes forcibly removed from the community for TB treatment. On an average, they had left their family for about 15 months at a time to Southern Canada, uh, where often uh, they weren't with another relatives or, or someone they knew, um, you know, anyways, there, there's this whole part of history that we have not seen justice for that. And that is directly the federal institution. We haven't seen, you know, we and we have seen this li current liberal government even in June of 2020 say we are going to delay our own timeline to the national responses to missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. We saw Mark Miller uh, a couple months ago. We're not we're not even now we're closer to March, but we weren't even close to March. I think it was November. They were like, we're not going to be able to meet boil water and boil water advisories. Mm -hmm. We're looking around like it's not even March. You're telling us already you're going to fail us. And then they turn around and they say, but we're, we want to pass and sign the UN declaration, knowing full well, meaning they want to tweak it so it works for them. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, there needs to be hope and I have hope. Do I expect them to do the right thing? No, because we have been proven time and time and time again that they won't, which is exactly why you need people like me in there, exactly why you need truth and transparency to uphold those very clear things and to be able to say on record, you're not telling the full truth, you are not being transparent, you are not fulfilling your obligations, and you have a responsibility, and you aren't fulfilling them. So I I would love to see more attention. Again, I, I'm not gonna put my hope on the federal government. I hope to see more pressure on the federal government from allies for Nunavut Mute on things like the housing situation. So I have that housing report that'll be coming out in a few weeks. I hope to see other people angry with us and seeing that injustice with us to put that pressure onto the federal government, because that's the only time we have seen good or bad things happen for Indigenous peoples throughout Canada from the federal institution is when there is national or international pressure. We have screamed into a void for as long as I've been born, uh, and that is much longer than the territory, and not, I can't even say much longer, seven years longer than the territory has been created, uh, but 27 years, all I have known is this idea that we live in turmoil and that it has become a normality. And that is not normal and shouldn't be normalized in Canada. And now I have an opportunity to say, you know, and the federal government has told us time and time again, they say, we know there is a housing issue. We know there is a suicide crisis. Well, if you know, then why aren't you doing anything to assist as part of your obligation, uh, as part of, you know, fulfilling that injustice and talk about reconciliation? Well, not going to meet the deadline to national inquiries to MMIWG, not going to end boil water advisory, but we're going to tweak a document that says we kind of support you, but eh, <laughs> after we made all the announcements that we're not going to fulfill anything that we just said. Mm -hmm. So I, I have hope. I don't have expectation. What I would like to see more is public assistance with public pressure for the federal institution, for the federal government to do the right thing. Uh, do you think we'll see an election this year? I, I think that, I mean, look at the commercials that are happening on TV. You're already seeing O'Toole and Trudeau, both sides are attacking each other actively. Uh, I think that the liberal government wants to see an election happen. And if that's what they want to see, they will make it happen. NDP, we do not. We do not need an election this year. People need help. 
People need to be able to get back on their feet, get vaccinated, and we need to ensure that day-to-day -day Canadians are able to come back from this whole COVID situation. And that's, that's an extremely frustrating part. I'm hoping that we can spark a conversation around recreating normal because this shouldn't be normal. It shouldn't be normal for these many Canadians to be struggling with the amount of basic things that Canadians do. We saw PharmaCare get shot down a promise that the Liberal government made back in their 2019 campaign. Well, you just had an opportunity to assist millions of Canadians in so many ways to not worry about life-threatening things. In the end, we'll save the Canadian economy billions of dollars. We had this beautiful opportunity in front of us and we saw once again, the Liberal government not actually fulfill what they had promised. So what we continue to see time and time again is talk, talking the talk, but not walking the walk. You know, we saw it during the Black Lives Matter movement when Trudeau took a knee. Ultimately, that position, that man, the prime minister has the ability to take a stand and change national policy and law to allow things to end so that we don't see as many brown and black individuals being killed unnecessarily by RCMP. There, there is power and ability in the institution and the excuses that we see to not make change simply aren't true. And again, going back to that's why you need people like me in there to be able to uphold and the, the federal government to account. The thing though, with these games that are starting to be played is that we are now starting to talk about an election in 2021 during a, a, a pandemic. Like to me, that's astonishing, but it's the reality. And the reality is that sure, we might be jumping into an election. Yes, we might need to be ready. Right now we are focused on pushing to help Canadians. Unfortunately, we do need to have the conversation though of that possibility. Uh, that being said, though, I'm just interested in how is the best way that Nunavut can get assistance right now, especially in Alvit, where we have seen COVID stay there for a, a, a number of months now, uh, again, pointing to that quality of life and that lack of resource in the community, which is a direct result of a lack of funding from the federal government over decades. Uh, we are seeing COVID now trapped in that community because of that. This is the federal government's fault. It is not the fault of the community or Inuit. It, I, and I've been there. I've seen the devastating situations that people are living in. I've had conversations with the mayor who said, it is so heartbreaking when one person in a severely overcrowded home gets COVID and there's nowhere else for everybody in that household to go. And that's the severity of the situation, the housing situation uh, with over a hundred people in that small community on the housing wait list. And one in three individuals in that community are 15 and under. The vaccine hasn't been proved, approved except for those 18 and over. So we still have another, the whole young population to think about. So there's just, there's all these layers and, and all these things. Uh, the Basics though, again, we're going back to the basics. It's a lack of space. It's a lack of being able to afford the space or food. Oftentimes people are trying to choose between rent and putting food on the table. Uh, I've heard tons of stories of parents not eating because they only have enough for their kids. Uh, seven out of 10 children in Nunavut go to school hungry. So how many parents are going hungry every day on top of that? So there's, there's just so many things and in so many ways, Nunavut just needs basic help. And again, that's why I always go back to, those are my three, uh, housing. Ultimately, we need safe spaces. We need more infrastructure. We need more ability for people to have that space of to heal and to be themselves. Could you imagine being a teenager and not being able to have your own room to be a teenager, uh, how frustrating that would be. Um, so I, 
again, I have hope. I don't have expectation. Where I'm turning to now is is the public, and which is why I love having these conversations and why they're so important because we have been in this fight for a long time by ourselves. It's not working. We need people uh, on our side that have the the ability to do that. Uh, what would an NDP government bring to Canada versus, say, a, a liberal or a conservative government? I think. I, I like to try and use examples of how that could actually look because I think that's one of the things that a lot of people have a hard time picturing because it's it's something that hasn't been a reality before. Um, I And I, I will start off by saying, in my experience and with what I've seen, we are the most organized party. Sometimes things are happening in the house really quick or we're going on to a vote or whatever. And you can clearly see other parties are not organized or know what on earth they are doing. And, you know, we have meetings and discussions where it's, we need to make sure all the uh, I's are dotted, T's are crossed, um, and some, a lot of the time we are waiting on the other parties, and we're ready to go, we're organized, we know what we're doing, so <laughs> what on earth, and, and, and a lot of the time, you know, like even when the pandemic had started, and the Liberal government didn't have the equipment you're supposed to be ready for situations like this. How do you, and they had like millions of pieces of expired equipment, things they were getting rid of. Like it was so nitty, follow Matthew Green on, on all that stuff. He's really good at the specifics, but even looking at the beginning of this unraveling and people, you know, and, and that is a common, uh, a common complaint is that the federal government isn't organized. NDP is, I have seen it. Um, also looking at, so right now I'm just talking about current stuff. So just mm -hmm. the organizational aspect, making sure that a lot more things are covered and the federal government loves to use the, you know, we don't have time resources. We will find it and make it and make sure that more things that need to be looked at are looked at and stop using this excuse of, we don't have time. It's a new program. You know, we hear all these excuses all the time. It doesn't work, so fix it. And you would see more of that from an NDP government. I think the the lack of transparency and accountability from the federal government. And, and you know, I think this is something that people really need to think about as Canadians. We have seen and made an idea that a federal institution looks like this, is a non-transparent doesn't fulfill injustice, doesn't fulfill responsibility or obligation institution in a way that it should because it serves all Canadians. With NDP, you would see that more of that accountability and that transparency because we we're here to serve you. We're here to serve Canadians. This isn't about big corporations or big business. This is about day-to-day -day people. And I, I think about those honest, raw conversations I've been able to have with Jugmi. There is no way I could ever say what I have to Jugmi, to Trudeau or Sheer. There is no way I could even get in a room by myself. Like, and you know, that's just the kind of lack of transparency that you can see clearly. And we have seen, you know, Jody Wilson Rainbow, Jane Philpot, when they got booted. Like what on earth was going on there? And that's a lack of transparency and accountability. And, you know, I think of, for example, Hunter Tutu, who I don't agree with the situation, but he did need assistance with substance abuse. What did the party do to him though? They booted him. Well, what about O'Regan who had went through a similar thing, had gone to treatment and is now a minister? Mm -hmm. So we can see these kinds of things very, very clearly that even though they say they value these things, in their actions, they don't. We don't see these kinds of things happen within the NDP. I can sit here and say, and I'm probably, you know, our party is the most transparent and I clearly have been very transparent about everything. 
I have never had to hide everything, anything, anything whatsoever from my leadership. And I've been able to have those really hard conversations in a way that makes sense for my constituency. I've been able to have messaging in a way that makes sense. You don't see me shouting about PharmaCare or Medicare because that's, it's, I believe in it, yes, and it is NDP policy, but it's not what my party, uh, sorry, my constituency rather, mm -hmm. it's not the priority of my constituency. So I have the power and ability to talk about that. You know, you look at the liberal candidate, you look at the liberal and conservative MPs, especially indigenous and minority, do they have power and ability to actually talk about the reality in their constituency? So those very clear uh, differences that we do see even between myself and, and other, you know, pick any liberal or conservative MP. Um, so just that switch in, uh, in the current, uh, but in the future as well, it's being able to tax the rich. It's being able to close loopholes that when we see like, oh my goodness, it, I don't understand how Amazon can be making record profits. And we have had thousands of small businesses have to close mom and pop shops for lack of better words, uh, individuals and, and in Canada, as a Canadian, you should have the power and ability to have that right to self-determination, to be able to work hard enough to get to a point where you can have a business. But instead, what we are seeing in COVID is a bunch of people having to put up their houses, having to make these crazy sacrifices to simply make it to the next month, make it to the next paycheck. And Amazon's making record profits. <laughs> the people are making Amazon cakes now on TikTok. And I'm like, people, are we not seeing how we're just fueling this multi-billion dollar industry? Like I look at a, what is it, Top Gear? Doesn't Amazon pay for Top Gear? Mm -hmm. That's a really cool show, but I'm like, man, look at all the <laughs> money they're spending. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, can we have the profits from that show and put housing in my, my writing? Um, so I just, and that's going back to recreating what a normal, means what mm -hmm. what normal means and how we view normal um so being able to tax and close uh these loopholes that ensures that that companies making money here are giving back to local are giving back here if we saw that we could see millions and billions of dollars come back into all different kinds of industry whether it's health or education pharma care uh, all of these different things and being able to, you know, even tax Amazon in the right way, being able to put in policy and law to ensure that the employees of these huge corporations get benefits that they should be seeing, get the livable wage they should be seeing, but because we know that these huge corporations can afford it, except what we're seeing is unfortunately these small independent businesses have to close. Uh, things like pharmacare coming into play, not having to worry about paying for medication and people, and that this is where I think, you know, we talk about more opportunity to education, more uh, ability to have access to basic and mental health care. Well, where's all that money gonna come from? And it's exactly taxing those, those big, uh, I've been trying to think of a word to use for them um, because it's not necessarily just big business and big corporation, but it's ensuring that money that is being made here, an equal, uh, uh, just, what's the word? Now I'm getting tongue tied. A justifiably <laughs> amount is coming back that should be, uh, that compensation is coming back that should be, and that we are also not seeing anything leave sneakishly out that we should, shouldn't be. So there's just power and ability to close a lot of those things. And again, that's what's really, really frustrating about liberal and past conservative governments is the power and ability to do that. Um, and once you start looking into those connections, you really see how much those parties do lean on their connections, do lean on their friends. Uh, I talk a lot about affordable living. 
uh, North Mart and Northern are the main suppliers in Nunavut. The same people, for lack of better words, that own Northern and North Mart also own 46 giant tiger locations. Giant tiger is a 13 plus billion dollar a year asset corporation. The chairperson of Giant Tiger is Scott Reed, a conservative member of parliament. Conser the conservative government was in power when they put in the Nutrition North program that is working for no one. Mm -hmm. So don't tell me you can't lower prices when the same people that own our main grocery line also own Giant Tiger. That is, or sorry, rather 64 Giant Tiger locations, which is a 13 point whatever billion dollar a year asset company which a conservative member of parliament is a chairperson for so once you start making all those links and seeing all those connections you really start saying yes people do lean on their connections people do make deals with their friends in the background whether or not we can actually point to those things is one thing but th there is clearly something happening. Mm -hmm. um, so again, going back to that accountability, that transparency that NDP would make sure is there, these programs don't work. Why would we put in programs that don't work? Um, so being able to ensure too that the programs reflect, um, re reflect the reality of whatever constituency. I think to, liberal and conservative governments love to use this idea of consultation it's not actual con it's conversation and mm -hmm. really the conversation is typically federal to it's one way um it's not a it's not a two-way street so you know even in in those conversations you see things like uh, in my writing in particular there's the mary river mine that wants a rapid expansion on phase two the current federal, the current liberal government is saying we have policy and procedure in place. If I wasn't there, no one would realize that this policy and procedure is majorly, majorly flawed. Mm -hmm. So if you have a flawed process, you have a flawed decision. That's it. You can't make a correct decision on the wrong, non full scope information. And that's what I mean. That's why you need me there. So now I can see, oh, okay, we're not being transparent. We're not being accountable to who we're serving. So let me make sure I'm connecting the dots and getting the right people in touch. That's what I mean by accountability. And you know, we're seeing this mine rapid expansion happen that my constituents don't. So you know, turn around and you look at the liberals talk about reconciliation. That's not, again, talk the talk. They don't walk mm -hmm. the walk. They're not interested in actually engaging and actually participating. They have policy and procedure in place. Doesn't work. Mm -hmm. I hope I know on the podcast too, when I keep saying policy and procedure sarcastically, I put my hands up in air <laughs> quote. Because, uh, <laughs> policy and procedure from the federal institution usually means policy and procedure that works more so for them, not mm -hmm. on the flip side for who they serve, which doesn't make sense. <laughs> so we would see more things, programming policy that is reflective of who is being served. And then uh, just my last question, obviously you're very busy with, with parliament uh, and uh, you know helping your constituents and, and seeing your constituents, but when you're not working, what do you like to do with your time? Yes, that's been very much a learning journey here over the last few months I was crazy I finally had looked at uh, back from like October 22nd and 23rd and really soaked in how much people were proud of me I hit the ground running in campaign and I never really stopped until I was forced to because I burnt out I went through major anxiety depression and and those effects are are still there of course it's not something that just uh, goes away mental health is something that is a uh, constant uh, to be working on as self-care is something to be constantly working on um so i really lost that in my first year of being a member i really i worked a lot um self-care is so important <laughs> So I, I've been finding the things that I like doing again. I, I should have brought it 
um, I found that I really like cross stitching. So I'm almost mm. done my first cross stitch and gonna figure out how to do, I'm gonna make my mom some cute stuff. I really like <laughs> sewing and uh, making earrings. So look out for the next new pair of earrings. I might've <laughs> made them. Um, so earring fashion and beading and I love going out for walks and stuff like that too. Um, looking to make more of a or find more of an outdoorsy space hopefully here in the in the next bit as the summer months come up so outdoor stuff and yeah sewing and I like um, I call my concerts I think people need to uh, when I was growing up and I think a lot of people especially in the north can relate to this um, my mom would be like blasting music Saturday morning and that was like notice where it was time to get up and help clean up mm -hmm. and it was I just remember it like being a beautiful Saturday or Sunday and blue skies and you were a teenager and you'd wake up like oh oh my goodness it's time <laughs> it's that time but then you would get into the groove and your mom's cool music's <laughs> playing and so I think I I like to do that too I like to try and enjoy my cleaning and I think people need to do a little bit more of, of that as well make their space um, more theirs I've been working on that too just painting and and that kind of stuff so yeah sewing and beading and being outside and really making my space mine is something that's really really important to me <laughs> 